the old neighborhood. If you're driving to Parkland from downtown, your best bet is to take the Dan Ryan Expressway, I-57, which cleaves like a wide river with a bend here My name is Eric Charles May, the author of Bedrock Faith, the 2021 One Book, One Chicago selection by the Chicago Public Library. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at Chicago Public Library, welcome. We are thrilled to welcome Stephen Walsh to the CPL virtual stage this evening. Tonight's event is part of the 2021 One Book One Chicago season, exploring the theme, Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock, and the book, Bedrock Faith by Eric Charles May. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for other upcoming programs, reading recommendations, on-demand video content, and much more coming now through the end of the year. Tonight's program is possible and One Book One Chicago is generously funded by donations to the Chicago Public Library Foundation. Visit cplfoundation.org for information on how you can get involved with their work. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by CPL's Latinx Heritage Committee, and I wanna thank them for their special support in making tonight's program possible. During the program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A, so please feel free to ask one. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Walsh and his forthcoming film, Southeast, A City Within a City. Stephen Walsh is a storyteller, breaking the stigmas of his Southeast Chicago upbringing and breaking ground in uncharted creative territory. The new kid on the production scene, Walsh has made the climb up from rather humble beginnings, defied stereotypes, and emerged as a John, Johns Hopkins graduate and two-time Emmy Award-winning producer. His concentrations are in education, writing, directing, and producing. He is the founder of Lucid Creative Agency, and his upcoming documentary is Southeast, A City Within a City. We are lucky to be able to see a sneak peek of that film tonight. The Southeast side of Chicago is an often overlooked and stigmatized neighborhood of the city, blocked by an overcast of misguided interpretation. Stephen's mission is to shed light on his stigmatized neighborhood, bringing together soldiers, scholars, gangsters, musicians, and politicians from the Southeast side's past and present. This is more than just history. This is a hands-on exploration of what it felt like to live here. See how the streets were then and how they've evolved to what they are now. Now, please join me in welcoming C Stephen Walsh to the CPL virtual stage. Welcome, Stephen. Hi. Jennifer, thank you so much for such a warm introduction. I am honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, as stated, I am the producer and director of the upcoming documentary, Southeast, A City Within a City. And it's a tale about the history and the evolution and de-evolution of the Southeast side of Chicago. Uh, we've been working on this project for about six years since we first started our creative agency. And what we're hoping to do and our aim with this film is to better educate those who lack awareness of what's really going on in our community and in our neighborhood and address some of those negative and misguided, um, the interpretation that the community gets. It's often looked at as a place covered in violence and, and decay. And we don't really talk about the things that people are doing to fight for a, a better tomorrow and what the things that people did yesterday to affect our, our present day. And that's what we aim to do with our film. We aim to 
provide a perspective that's full, um, that incorporates different people from different walks of life, born in different generations, held different occupations in life, um, to tell a true and whole tale of, of what happened from the start of the uh, information of the community all the way up until present day. Um, and I am uh, spearheading it as a uh, writer, director, and producer of the project. Um, like I said, it began about five or six years ago when I was simply just talking and learning about the neighborhood from my grandfather. That's where the entire story came from. Um, it began as my quest to find out more about his life. And through time and, and through uh, research, I, I come to find out that what we need to do is so much more than tell just his story because his is uh, a representation of what happened to our community as a whole. So before we get into any more about the formation of the idea, um, I'd like to begin with a trailer for those who have not or do not know too much about uh, the documentary. So we're gonna begin with a one minute trailer that we've been using to really showcase what we're trying to do here. So we'll start off with us uh, with the trailer for the upcoming documentary, Southeast, a city within a city. You know, it didn't always look like this, feel like this. It was beautiful here once and full of life. There was always something to do, somewhere to go, dances and block parties and fests and lights and magic. People didn't have to leave to find work. The work was right here. When you look at my neighborhood now, what do you see? You know what I see? The path is so cold. Put it this way, once I got out the steel mill and the steel mill closed, my whole world fell apart and I was I got locked up and went to jail. Now the spirits take control. So that is where this entire adventure kicked off. Um, and before we talk more about the documentary, I'd like to spend some time talking about where the idea really fully came from. Um, like I said, we've been working on this for about six years, uh, working heavily on it in the last two years. But it all started when I first moved back to Chicago. Um, I went to, like I said, I grew up on the Southeast side my entire life. I went to Whitney Young for high school. And from there, I went to the University of Illinois for college. Um, after that, I was a teacher in Houston and I did grad school at Johns Hopkins University. So I was gone for, for quite some time. And for my family, I was one of the first to really leave the nest and really leave the neighborhood. And that was hard for me. Um, it, was, it was difficult being in environments where I, I stood out, um, where I didn't feel too comfortable. And a lot of times I felt like I gravitated towards wanting to go home and wanting to be back where I felt myself. Um, and so when I was finishing grad school, I wanted to come back home. My uh, younger sister, Hannah, was pregnant and it was the first child of my, uh, my siblings. Uh, so I wanted to come home and help out. And so I came back with the aim of starting a creative agency. I saved up money from grad school and teaching and I bought a camera. And um, I spent the whole first year in 2015 really just trying to figure out how to use it. Um, and I didn't really have that many jobs and I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I spent a lot of time really at home, um, setting up the camera with the tripod, practicing lighting, um, practicing sound and camera angles. And often I needed a subject, I needed somebody in front of the camera. So I used my grandfather, um, you know, he was always home at the time. He's pretty much always been home my whole life. Um, and he's always had just such great spirit. So I thought, you know, let me spend some time with him. I've been gone for a while. What a perfect way for us to bond, for me to practice my craft. And um, it was after I was filming him a few times and showing people to get advice on, you know, did I shoot this right? Is he in, is he in focus? Um, can you hear him? Is the sound crisp? 
And nobody was really giving me advice on my techniques. They were more so really just entranced by my grandfather. Um, and that's when I realized maybe I'm onto something. People say, you know, this man is extremely funny. His, his stories are, are just so engaging and his music is incredible. He's pretty much always got a guitar by him. He's never really more than a few, a few feet away from his guitar or notebook. So, you know, I pretty much just filmed him sitting at home, you know, drinking, playing music, talking. Um, and that's where everything really began. I uh, was always curious as to how this person who I know had such a good soul grew to be such a dark individual. You know, when I was growing up, he was always pretty angry. Um, he kind of always had a drink in his hand, really upset at the world. And I never understood that because I, I knew deep inside he was such a kind person. He's the type of guy that as soon as he sees you, he wants to feed you. He wants to ask how your day is. He wants to do something for you and yet. I can see that life turned him to a, to a, he formed a, 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 a villainous sense to him. And I was just always curious about that because I didn't really know. And, and I didn't know what was going on or what happened in the neighborhood. So I wanted to find out. And that's where everything with the story kicked off. Um, I started to interview him more about the neighborhood and about how the neighborhood changed. And that's really where everything started to snowball into what it is now, which is, a documentary no longer specifically about my grandfather's life, but about my community as a whole. Because I've come to realize through, through research alongside talking with him that his story is not as unique as I thought. Um, there were so many people in our neighborhood that were affected by the mills closing. Our entire community was destroyed by it. And so as I learned more about that, I realized that's that's the story. It's It's not just about him it's about our community as a whole and it's not just about the steel mills but more so it's about what happened when they closed i think that's the the area that i see as not fully been told and definitely not really told from a black or brown perspective so that's where all of the ingredients for what we have now um, came from it, it started with him and, and now it's more of a quest for me to discover what happened in my neighborhood and so i started asking more individuals from the community ranging from musicians to artists to politicians to gangsters to teachers to mothers um, to get a real full sense of what happened and that's what the whole adventure of the documentary is it's it's my quest to find out about my neighborhood and how my grandfather's past is affecting my daughter's future so as time went on, the story got bigger and bigger, and we wanted to make sure that perspective was the key, um, especially with what's been going on in these last couple of years. I think what we're realizing is that these neighborhoods, um, they often don't have storytellers from within the neighborhood telling the story, and, and, and oftentimes it's not a full perspective. Um, so I wanted to come in and, and be someone that could be a voice for the community and to help uplift it instead of bringing it down, which is what we typically see. So with our tale, we're primarily focusing on the individuals around the 50s all the way up until the mills closing. So my grandfather, he's from San Antonio, Texas. Most of my family that I know is from San Antonio, Texas or from Mexico. Um, and he moved here in 1950, a little later than the majority of his family. But as you'll see in the documentary and as I'm learning through research, um, a lot of black and brown folks from the South um, and from Mexico came to fill in jobs when the European settlers were off fighting war or when we were losing European immigrants coming into the country because of those world wars, World War I and World War II. Um, on top of the labor movement and the unions who were fighting for better working conditions, better pay, um, just a you know, better working day, um, to combat that, they would bring in cultures different ethnic groups, different racial groups to essentially pin the cultures against each other. Who would do it for cheaper? Um, who's gonna give us less issues? And that's not, you know, part of what brought the melting pot of our community. And it's also part of what brought a lot of the, the issues, the early issues with race in, within our community. So our documentary covers all of that. It goes through the history of when the Potawatomi Native Americans and Algonquin Native Americans were there um, the European settlers coming in, but our focus is around 1950 when my grandfather enters the stage. And we start the story by introducing really what the community was like before everything went down. 
Because again, when I grew up, those same places were looked at as the places you don't go. So right now, what we want to do is show a first ever sneak peek for you all to see uh, for the documentary. This is going to be a section that's really early on in the documentary. Again, I think I'm really big on, on the hero villain story. Um, and this is the world for our heroes. This is what the southeast side of Chicago looked and felt like during its glory days, during the days that I've never seen. It's a combination of voices from those we've been interviewing these last two years. And it's it's their perspective for what it was like to grow up. What was a day like in, in the southeast side of Chicago? So next up for you, we will uh, show you this clip. It's about four minutes. And I'm very excited to showcase it for the first time. Here it is. My father brought us here in a truck from San Antonio, Texas. And when I was two years old, I came with the family. Well, we left San Antonio to go pick cherries in Michigan because it was en route to, I guess, I don't know, because I was two years old. But they said we were going to go pick cherries and then make a little money and go to Chicago where my uncle had already moved to. And he had an apartment for my mom and dad upstairs. My sister's in the front of the truck with my mother and father, me and my brothers are in the back of the truck. And we hear him, you know, he, he, he squeaks the wheels. So we, we, we stopped, we made it, right? He opened up the back of the truck and he said that I told my brothers, Hora de cabrones, that means come on, you guys, let's go, okay? And, and we jumped out of the truck and there was kids all in front of our house and they were already, they were playing. I guess that was the, nor the norm. They were sitting there playing jacks on the, on the sidewalk and, you know, kids were playing marbles and shit and they were just talking trash, you know, kid shit. And uh, little did I know that those were going to be my friends for the rest of my life. And, and, and mind you now, I didn't know how to speak English. I was a stone Mexican when I came, and two weeks later, I couldn't speak Spanish anymore. Most of the people who, who lived in the area had been immigrants from one place or another and had all these different kinds of backgrounds. So it was incredibly cosmopolitan in some ways, but people kind of had their little insular world. So like, you know, people would walk to work and you'd have your church right there and there'd be, you know, a tavern right there. They would sh shop there. You know, they just had really tight social bonds. And again, people stayed over generations because the work was so stable. It used to glow. Okay, that's a lot of money. Everybody in the neighborhood had money because they were making money at the mills. It wasn't your getting laid off at that time. It was like, if you got fired from one mill, next week you'd be working at another mill, okay? So, so the, the work was plentiful. Back from when I was young, it was thriving. It, the, all the steel mills were working, everybody had money. Commercial Avenue was beautiful. Um, ladies used to wear white gloves and hats and purses and gentlemen used to wear suits <laughs> all the time. It was, it was wonderful. Um, I, on 89th and Escanaba, to the right of me were Polish people, to the left of me were Serbian people, uh, down the street, Irish people, Mexican people. But we got along. The, neighbor, the people in the neighborhood got along. We respected each other. You know, I, I could remember coming home and people would be sitting on the porch talking. Or there'd be kids outside playing at one or two in the morning. There'd be kids playing, running around on a weekend. Something you don't see nowadays. It was, it was the kind of community that you want your kids to grow up in. People sitting on the porch in the summer. You know, um, Labor Day was always a big a big festival and uh, we celebrated we celebrated our workers you know we idolized those people so they built this city the mill was a uh, the, the life of this community for instance my parents before I was born in 1950 they were working as field workers in, in, in Mexico so they heard rumors that they were hiring at the mill what they didn't know was they were scabs see they were hired to go work in the mill while this major strike was going on. After the strike was over, they were very, very lucky. The mill kept them. So my father and his brothers were able to start you know, their, their time in the mill. They didn't need geniuses or people to go to colleges and this and that in those years. They needed laborers, they needed people to go to work in the mill. Because every, all this neighborhood ever thought of was that mill was never gonna disappear. The mill was gonna be here forever. So all of us 
that grew up in that period, we were geared to be workers. So that was a sneak peek, uh, one of the first ever that we've ever shown. Um, what I really want to do here, what I, what I hope to establish really early on is, is this world and, and who our characters are in this world. So you'll have titles eventually for all of those individuals, but you have someone that was a teacher and educator for 40 years. You have an artist that's been a major influence in our community for decades. Um, you have Vietnam veterans, you have um, firefighter uh, captains, you have politicians. And so that's a, a bit of what you're, that's a little bit of everything that you're gonna get from this documentary. Um, and what we wanted to do in this section, which is called Diploma to Hard Hat, is really establish what life was like for them back then. Um, you have this neighborhood that was extremely diverse, which it's not like today, um, where everyone seemed to be getting along, which it's, not like today. Uh, and everyone, you know, kind of had a clear purpose, clear goal, clear path, which is not like today. Um, so I really want to contrast what's going on now. That's what this is all about. Um, they talk about this neighborhood, they talk about these streets, lively, um, full of joy, so many people there, so many things to do. And, you know, for me growing up in the 90s, those were those same streets that I was told not to go on you know, for fear, my family just trying to look out for me. Those same parks that these individuals fought to keep, I wasn't allowed to go to either. So, you know, my quest in this, in this story is to find out how in two generations that, that came to be. Because those same places are nowhere near that glory that they once were, they're far from it, it's the opposite. It's like, you know, those places are like ghost towns now. So, what I want to do right there is showcase how, you know, just how different the environment was of that same area that now people are, are afraid of, the Chirac, the south side of Chicago. Um, I wanted to use that time to introduce who these people are and so that throughout the film, we can really see how from their perspective, everything changed and why it changed. And so really what happens from there is we start to kick off different sections of, of what goes on in the history of the community. Um, and throughout the documentary, we're going to cover topics such as the Vietnam War, which uh, a lot of people don't know really, you know, devastated our community in a, in a unique way in the sense of, you know, we lost a lot of black and brown people, a lot. I mean, all, all people, but, um, you know, in the community South Chicago, which is one of the first Mexican and Mexican American communities in the city, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's rumored that in one church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, there was more individuals lost in that parish than any other perish in the country. So you have this community where all these people are, are building this country, are fighting for this country. And then the mills close and everyone just gave up on us. And so that's what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to achieve in our storytelling is, is going through that, going through the evolution of the street gangs, which in my grandfather's day were very different than the street gangs that we see today. He was one of a, a founder of one of the original street clubs in the community called the Turks. And I'm hearing from these individuals about back in the day, those clubs that were having fundraisers in the community, helping families that were devastated by Vietnam War, um, throwing concerts and sock hops. And yeah, they had their squabbles and they had their issues with the other clubs, but you know, that was just part of growing up and growing pains. And you know, there's obviously gonna be some, some issues with multiple cultures coming in, especially when they're pinned up against each other at the steel mills, you know. Um, so we go through how those clubs went from something that I think were intent, the original intention was good to, to what they are now, which is, you know, kind of like a main source of revenue. It's almost like a job. It's one of the highest paying jobs out of high school in our neighborhood. And that's the sad part. Um, that's, that's the really sad part. But I want to show why that happened, because these guys lost their jobs in the steel mill and there wasn't any replacement. So you have all these people that have lost work and they don't really have a means of taking care of their family. So they did what they had to do. And I think that's where we get into the dark side of our story. Um, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this from a parent's perspective. Now I have a three-year-old daughter and if shit hit the fan, I'd do whatever I had to do to take care of her. I, I, would, I will sacrifice myself any day to make sure that she's okay. So 
um, I really want to show how how difficult it was to make those decisions um, and how psychologically the mills closing, the Vietnam War, the need for survival, how how that affected us, how it affected our 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 dinner conversations, how it affected our you know kids going to sleep at night. Um, in addition to the clubs and and the war, we're going to talk a lot about race. Um, I think our, our, our neighborhood was unique in the sense of you really could at certain points in history see a very beautiful rainbow of people on, a, on any given block. Um, we did some research going through census data from different decade, decades and we saw the neighborhood change, but at certain points it was, it was beautifully diverse. You look at my grandfather's yearbook at Thorpe Middle School or CVS High School and you really saw a, a nice eclectic group of individuals and you see that change through time. It's now it's all black and brown now. But where and how did that happen? And, and why is it all black and brown? Why were some people able to leave and other people weren't? Um, what was it about the mills closing that, that generated such a devastation in the community? That's, that's really what we, we constantly go back to. And above all, what did it do to our heroes who eventually became villains? That's, that's the overall idea for this project. Um, and when the mills closed, that's where we really start to get into the neighborhood that I saw, that my mother and father saw, which was a devastated, destroyed, neglect, neglected neighborhood. You know, there weren't businesses around. I was told that the only way for me to make it was to make it out. And I think that's just a sad thing to tell kids about their community. If you wanna make it, you gotta leave. And so what we aim to do is um, showcase not only all of that devastation that was brought to us by others, but balance that with some of the things that you don't always see. Um, yes, there is an aftermath of high environmental concerns. You know, we, we have cancer and, and asthma rates through the roof. Um, you know, violence is, is extremely high compared to other communities. But I want to showcase why. Because these people had to become territorial, to become tribal even, in order to survive, in order to take care of their loved ones. Um, and another big aspect of this is, is, is the music and the art from our community. Uh, my grandfather's been a songwriter his entire life. Ever, ever since I've known him, he's always had a guitar in his hand, a notebook. He's always thinking and writing about music. He's one of the most creative souls I've ever had the pleasure of being around. He's influenced me in, in, in such a big way. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Um, I saw him with a notebook and so I picked one up too. Um, I saw him being creative, and so I thought, you know what, I can do that too. So uh, we're using his music that he's been writing for the last 60 years to also tell the story of this Southeast side, because he's written it at different times in his life when different things were happening. So he has songs about what it felt like when the mills closed, about what it felt like when he saw his friends dying in Vietnam War, about what it felt like when he had to make very tough choices to take care of my mother and my, my aunts and uncles. Um, so where we think this documentary differs from others is, is, is in the sense that we're trying to make this as, as fully of a perspective as possible, not only in who the voices are, but also in how we're telling the tale. We'd like to add, you know, mixes of reenacted scenes of poetry, of music. We're going to use art to tell the story, um, to really give a, a full, full lesson on, on what this neighborhood was what it is today and, and what people are doing about shaping it from here on out. Um, it's been a blessing to work on this. You know, like I said, I've been working on it very, very passionately for these last two years, um, basically when the pandemic hit and things for my company started to slow down, I had some time to pick this back up. And especially with what's going on in, you know, today with race. And I think it's more important to ev than ever to really challenge everyone to go back and you know next time they're sitting at home at the dinner table asking their their elders about their life and i i really hope that that's what people walk away with with this documentary um whether you're from southeast chicago where you, whether you're from the west side of chicago whether you're from germany whether you're from pittsburgh you know i think a lot of places in the world were affected by industrialization deindustrialization demographic movements um you know, I know our story is not unique, and I think that's what also makes it beautiful, because so many people can relate to this. I've I've shown this to people outside of the community, and a lot of them, you know, have that same old bitter grandfather 
um, or have that same rundown community or know of that rundown community and know of the people in it that have this sort of notoriety to them. You know, I know if you're from the neighborhood and you're watching this, you know that when you say you're from the Southeast side, people look at you a little differently. Um, and I've grown to be proud of that. There's, there's a fierceness to us that, you know, that, that leaves an effect on people. And I think that's, that's just so wonderful. So the film, you know, not only brings out some of the darker past, but it also highlights what, you know, some of the new age individuals are doing, which to me is a story that's, it's now starting to gain traction. The, the youth alliances, the environmental activists, the academics, the families, um, the community coming together in the aftermath, rising like a phoenix, coming together to, to rebuild what was destroyed and what was taken away from us. So we are getting really close um, day by day. We're making more and more progress. You know, there's been a lot of things that have gotten in the way from us being exactly where we want to be on time. But, you know, making a film with very limited budget, very small team um, in the pandemic is it's not easy. There's about four of us really working on this. Um, typically, there's, you have a pretty big team to make a 90-minute documentary. So we're doing what we can. Um, you know, there's three of us really doing all the shooting, editing. My younger sister is an amazing marketer who's been helping to, to promote the film and, and buy, get the community to buy in. And I think that's been just as important as the documentary itself is, has been the making of this documentary. Um, seeing the small businesses help support the film, seeing the artists come together to help paint the picture, literally, literally paint the picture. Um, it's, it's just been wonderful. I feel like I've, I've never felt so connected to my community and, and my family at the same time. This is, it's, it's literally been a dream come true for me to unite and align all the things that I find important, which is you know community, family, and growth and self-growth. Um, so at this point right now, we're getting really close to finishing the story. Um, I think what we're realizing is that there are certain voices that we're still missing that we want to bring in to help tell the tale. Um, we're producing all the music right now, um, which is its own beast because most of the time, you know, documentaries don't have an original score and soundtrack, but that's what we're aiming to achieve. Uh, writing and, and producing all the music on our own. We're making, you know, the we're, we're, we're the instruments, we're the voice, we're the lyrics. We're, we're shooting it, we're recording it, we're editing it, we're coming up with the music video ideas. So um, it, 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 is a, it, it is a challenging project and we're gonna aim high and, and hope that we can achieve everything we can. So far, I am just so happy with what I'm seeing. It's, it's really easy for me to put together because you know everyone's saying the same thing, whether they're black, white, grew up in the 50s, grew up in the 70s, you know, it's like people I can just, I can cut so easily because they're saying the exact same story. Um, so again, it's, it's, a, it's been a dream come true. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to tell this story. And, and as we get closer and closer, I, I, I can feel the weight of the importance. And, um, you know, for that reason, we want to make sure that everyone knows what we're doing. And so we're, you know, we're happy to be here and I'm, I'm extremely happy to show that clip. Um, we still got a long ways to go, but we are going to show the community, uh, the documentary anyways, uh, in the middle of October, October 15th, we'll be having a screening in uh, South Chicago at 93 Studios. So we very much encourage anyone to come out. It's free. Um, it's not finished. It's not not even close, but uh, we're gonna consider it one giant focus group. So we would love people from the community or not from the community to come check it out. Um, and I'm here. So if there's any questions anyone has in the audience, I would be very happy and honored to, uh, to answer them. Thanks so much, Stephen. We do have some questions that have come in uh, via email and on the chat. So We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, the first one, of course, several people are asking, when is the movie coming out? <laughs> and I know you <laughs> right. just said, you're not really sure, but uh, yeah, lots of people but yeah, want to know I mean, that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, you know what? I actually, I should have typed in and asked that same question. Um, <laughs> it, it's hard to tell because of the fact that there are things we want to do that are a little bit of a stretch to get done, you know? So when my grandfather or, you know, myself, we're the two writers of the music. If we write a song, you know, we have to get it performed by someone. We have to get it recorded. We have to get it mastered. We have to make a music video. We have to shoot the music video. We have to edit the music video. So, you know, one project like that could take a week. And if we cut it out, it could save a week. So it, it, it's kind of give or take, but the story is complete. And I think that to me was the main, the main meat of it was, can we get all of these voices to come together and tell one whole story? That's ready. That's ready to rock and roll. 
October 15th will be showing that. I would imagine right by around Christmas, we can have a very comfortable completed film, at least first draft, fully first draft. What a great uh, New Year's present, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's hope, let's hope. So we got a few more questions. Uh, what has been the reaction of people from the neighborhood to your film? Oh man, that's probably been my favorite part. It's, 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 it's the internalization that the people in the community are, are getting from this, which it, I, just, I just can't imagine there are that many stories and documentaries where people will be so excited to get behind. I mean, I have people messaging me that I haven't talked to in 20 years, just, just, just showing love, you know? My old friends that joined gangs, I mean, people I didn't even think knew really how to rock and do social media are messaging me saying, Steven, I think what you're doing is so important. You're telling the story that no one really tells. And like things like that, it's like, I, you know, I, I, at this point, we're pretty much out of money. That's, that's my currency right there. When I get a message like that from someone that's just happy to see someone trying to tell the story, it's, there's just no better joy. I mean, we'll be in the summer, we were out filming, you know, all day and all night, and there'll just be people coming, dropping off water bottles, asking us if, if we want lunch. And, you know, these are the, the stories you don't, you don't hear in the news. And I think, you know, that community involvement and the, the marketing that we're doing, I mean, the social media presence we've gained, our Facebook, we're having like thousands of, of likes and reactions. It's insane because really that's just started off as like me asking my sister to do me a favor and help me out with Facebook, you know? And now I feel like that's turned into our source of research, our source of archive materials. There's so many people reaching out saying, hey, you should check out this book or, hey, my family got a bunch of old footage if you want to take a look at it. So I mean, it's, it's literally the making of the film is the most beautiful aspect is specifically because of the community involvement. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of comments in the chat that are just, we're excited, or my uncle used to work at the mills. So that's definitely, you can see that in, in, in our chat here tonight as well. Um, can you speak to the uh, role of labor in shaping the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how the neighborhood was, was was created. It was it was an industrial neighborhood. It was built on industry. You know, a community like Hegwish was built specifically to mirror the industrial Pullman. Um, you know, this this neighborhood brought in people because of labor. So you know, if you look at the history of, of the, if you look at the history of the community, I mean, you know, Europeans arrived around the 1600s, um, where the railroad started to become formed. And you have people coming in from Northern and, and Western Europe. Eventually you have Southern and Eastern Europeans coming in. Um, so you have this really interesting melting pot of European cultures uh, coming in for this, for these for labor. You know, um, all of our high schools and all of our grammar schools are named after labor leaders. And I think 80 to 90% of our community probably doesn't even know who Taylor is, you know who, uh, what Besmer is from Besmer Park, some of these big names that I, I'm realizing now I know, but, you know, five years ago, I didn't know. So labor shaped us in the sense of it's the name of our streets. It's, it's the name of our schools. Um, you know, it's where so many of our ancestors, you know, it's the reason why they came here. And I think that's the American story, I think, at, at large. So you know, again, I'm, it's almost weird that the story is becoming less and less unique. I'm like feeling, at first I thought this was like the most special story. And now I'm realizing, man, this is kind of like the American nightmare almost, you know, they don't talk about this, but I think that's where people can relate because in a lot of us, it doesn't, really, you know, majority of us, I, I'd say our people came here for work. Um, and that's no different in our, if anything, it's exacerbated in, in our neighborhood. Um, we have someone who's asking, can you describe the geographical boundaries of the areas you are covering? What exactly is the Southeast side for yeah, those who might yeah. not know? Yeah, um, there was an author and historian by the name of Dominic Pasiaga who um, wrote a lot about the Polish com community in Chicago, worked on a book with Rod Sellers, who's our local historian, who's one of the most kindest souls I've, I've ever met in my life, who's been extremely helpful um, with the history and just organizing it because when I first, you know, again, mind you, everyone who doesn't know too much about me, I, I don't really make, do I'm not a documentarian. Everyone keeps calling me a filmmaker. I have not made a film yet. You know, I make commercials. I produce commercials. I write a lot. Um, I use a camera a lot for, for the client work I do, but I don't necessarily make documentaries. This is my first stab at it. So I, I need a lot of help and I've, I have no issues asking for it. I was raised that way. Um, 
So the people coming in have been really helpful. And Rod Sellers pointed out in, in one of his books, uh, Dominic Paciago wrote an introduction and he called the neighborhood a city within a city. And I thought that was beautiful. I originally had the documentary called South Chicago. That was what it was originally called because that's where my grandfather was from. Um, however, I've really come to realize that um, and I've, I've asked people what, you know, what is our neighborhood called? Because people are from the South side, you're from the East side, you're from South Chicago. So like us coming up with the name was daunting because you can't please everyone. But after talking to the people and I'm, you know, the way I was raised was you, you start with your elders. I want to see who put in the work first. And I talked to enough of them and they had worked generations to call the neighborhood, the Southeast side. And when we say the Southeast side, we're talking about four communities that essentially make up the 10th ward, which is South Chicago, um, the kind of overarching original name for the community uh, and eventually split up as time went on into different neighborhoods. So we have South Chicago, the East side, which is where I'm from, South Deering, which is where my father's from and Hegwish. So those are the four communities that make up the, the 10th ward that make up this industrial, once industrial world that is the Southeast side. Um, and for those who are not too keen, um, about Chicago geographics, a lot of times you say you're from the east side, people think you're swimming in Lake Michigan because that's pretty much all that most people think Chicago is. It's like west side, north side, south side, Lake Michigan. And we're kind of like right in that tip, right underneath it. We're right underneath Lake Michigan, more east than you can get anywhere. Um, and so that, and that's, you know, that's where the names came from. The east side is east of the Calumet River. So, so that's the area we're very unique compared to other neighborhoods because we're pretty much separated from everything else. You got the Indiana border and you pretty much have to cross a bridge to get into our neighborhood. And that I think is very unique compared to other ones. It was, it, it was just literally its own land built based on industry. Um, someone else says, it's so inspiring to hear you talk about the community rebuilding itself around your project. What has your grandfather's reaction been to his role as a muse for the film? Oh, man, you know, it's it's interesting because it, it depends who you're asking and when you're asking, because my gramps right now is like, he thinks he's John Travolta. He's, he's Johnny Depp now. He's like the neighborhood star. He really is. I mean, he's kind of been like that his whole life. He's always had this aura and energy. But, um, you know, I really think that this project like brought him back to life. It's, it's been beautiful. I mean, like I said, he uh, and a lot of people in our neighborhood struggle. They, uh, they lost their job and we're seeing that today. We're seeing in the pandemic now where people are losing their jobs and they don't, they don't know how to react. Um, because it's hard when you're told to do something your whole life and then that thing is taken away. It's just hard to wake up. It's just hard to leave the house because you don't really know why you're leaving. And so, you know, for him when he lost his job and me catching him only after that, I really caught that dark side of him, that downside, that sad side, that mad side. And now, you know, he's, he's got lights again. He's spirited again. He's writing music. I mean, he's 72, I think, 73. He wrote a song the other day. It made me cry. I mean, it's, 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 it's so wonderful to see that he is so in, engrossed in this. I mean, he, he's taking it as his personal responsibility to make sure that I have what I need. And, you know, for us, it's, you know, we don't, we didn't always have that bond and, and, and we were close, but now I feel like he's like my partner, you know, we're, we're writing together. I'm writing music with my grandpa. It's like, it's like a dream come true. He's, he's wicked smart. Again, it's, you know, he's one of those people where you see what life did to him and you would never know that he, he'll know more about the rise and fall of Rome than anyone I know. He knows more about, you know, history and knowledge and Alexander the Greats and, and Robin Hoods. And he's just, he's just a whiz. He's brilliant. Um, but he didn't, you know, he didn't, I don't even think he finished high school. He said he graduated from the school of hard knocks. <laughs> he used to always tell me when I was a kid, the only thing that prevented him from going to college was high school. So, you know, on paper, he's not the most educated, but again, he's, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant person. And I think this documentary has is, is brought him back to life. It's, 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 it's wonderful. And again, and that, 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 that leads me to that hopeful action item at the end of watching this doc is that everyone goes home and, you know, says, hey, grandma, tell me, tell me a little bit about your life. That, that gives them life again. And I think that that family, that, that circle of life where the, where the old tell the young is, is what makes us advance generationally. So I feel like I'm, I'm a much smarter individual because I, I try to avoid mistakes that he made. And so hopefully that's, that's the aim for everyone. Well, that kind of perfectly leads into the next question. Uh, somebody asked, what advice do you have for other aspiring filmmakers who would like to tell the story of their own neighborhood or their own community? Um, 
you know, it, it, it's tough because I, I think what I'm seeing is so many people have these ideas. Um, and, and I think you have to start there. I think that's been the most helpful part with us was that this idea is a very, it's a beautiful story. So I, I think I first would encourage you to make sure you have a story. And there's a, there is one, I'm sure there is, but you have to do your research. It's, you know, I, this is something I put in, you know, maybe 50 hours a week on top of my 50 hour a week work week. So it's definitely not something that I think you should, you should take lightly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sacrificing a lot. My team is sacrificing a lot to, to make this happen. I'm supposed to be watching my daughter right now. My sisters are babysitting right now. So it's like, it's things like that. And I think that goes for not only anyone who's trying to make a film, but anyone who's trying to do something that they're passionate about and probably not getting paid fully for, you know, um, you, you have to really consider what, what toll that's going to take. Um, and luckily for me, you know, my family, my daughter's mother, my, my siblings, we're all in on this. We're in this together. My daughter's a producer on this. She's actually a producer on the documentary because I've seen a bunch of famous people making their kids producers. So I thought, let me start that too. But, um, you know, it, it's a lot of work. I mean, I, I, I fall asleep with a with computer screen in front of my face and I wake up and I get right back to it because I know I have to put in my seven, eight hours of work so that my daughter could eat, so that my family has the needs, you know, has what they need. Um, and I had to sacrifice everything else so that I can make this happen. So for any filmmaker that wants to do this, I think you have to really know what you're signing up for. It's, it's the biggest commitment I've ever made in my life. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how, how I can't get it out of my head. It's all I think about. And I love it because I, I, I have the support when people tell me that, you know, keep going, that, that really helps. But, you know, we ran out of money pretty quick because just to, you know, like I said, just to make one song, ten thousand dollars just put it all together that that adds up and that's just the song what are we gonna do for the other you know the, the actual story so you know depending on on you know your resources your resourcefulness um you need a team you need a heart you need a brain um and you need a lot of patience because for me there was a story i wanted to tell and then i interviewed everyone and they didn't necessarily say the lines I wanted them to say or they or the way I wanted them to say it. So, you know, me as a as a chef cooking this up, um, you know, I, I wish I wish they said that line the one way that, you know, that was passionate, but they didn't. Or or wow, I didn't even think that was an important aspect. And now that's 15 minutes of our film. So you got to be dynamic, um, you know, especially if you're a first time filmmaker like us. We're just we're just trying to have fun and, you know, trying to make sure that we tell the story accurately. Also, make sure you do your research or find people that can, because one, you know, one wrong thing can change things if, 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 if your information is not valid. So it's a full effort, um, it, which is why these projects typically cost a quarter million dollars to make. You know, we're going to do it for maybe 40000 if we're lucky, 50. Um, so, you know, just be aware that most of the time when you're making a documentary, you're under-resourced, you're understaffed. Um, so you have to really want it. You have to really want it and you have to come up with a plan execute and be able to be creative if, if things don't go as planned. Sorry, I'm talking, I'm talking no, to your great. over here, Jennifer. No, that's wonderful. No, I think that's great advice. Um, someone else asks, you speak so eloquently and honestly about the <clears throat> tribal clubs, the struggles and um, issues in the community. How hard is it to handle that sensitively when you're making the film? That's a wonderful question. Whoever that is, message me after. That's a First of all, thank you for saying that I speak eloquently about those things. Um, it's hard to speak eloquently about gangs. You know, that's, that's it's interesting. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm just throwing away. I'm just blown away by the question. You asked <laughs> I, think, I think the question is, how hard is it for you to um, handle that sensitively when you're making the film, given the, the subject matter and the sort of challenges around that? Well, I, I think what I always remind myself of is just how important it is for me to be honest and, and keep it raw. Um, you know, gangs is a tough subject because, you know, my family included, we've, we've had a lot of loss from gangs, from, from the violence and just, just the psycho, the psychological effects it, it had on people. So it's tough because I'm, I'm, I'm asking people to talk about their, you know, grandson being murdered, about their, their nephew going to jail for the rest of their life. Um, you know, really, really digging into some tough conversations, but I think it has to be told. And even these young gang mingers that are out here now and that people see and they can't seem to understand why they are the way they are. I, I, I want you to understand it. 
because I grew up with these kids, you know, these are the, these were my, my friends growing up and to see them change now as an adult who, you know, was fortunate to have some support, you know, I can go back and really think about what was different about my house and their house. And fortunately I had, you know, an incredibly strong set of women that raised me and my sisters made sure that they knew not to make those same mistakes, but not everybody had that or they had that, but they had, you know, their, their mom or their dad or their you know, grandmother, they had to work too much time to, to really sit down and help them like that. So, you know, I had somebody that taught me how to read and somebody that helped me with my homework. And I had friends that didn't have that. So, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna know what else is the right thing to do when all you see is people putting you down and, and, and then there's people around you that are telling you, here's a better life, come over here and make some money. Um, at a place in, an, in a world where you don't have money and where some of these people, and I know this for a fact, might be under 15 taking care of mouths, having mouths to feed, that's tough. So um, I, I try to be sensitive with it, but at the same time, you know, I'm not glorifying gangs. I'm nowhere near trying to do that. I just want people to understand that, you know, my, my homies that grew up and joined gangs, it, their eighth grade yearbook, they didn't put that they wanted to be a Latin king. They put that they wanted to be a lawyer or an astronaut, an astronaut, you know, and, and life happens and there's not a lot, not enough access for them to, to, to see that come to fruition. So it, it's, it's a tough conversation. But again, I, I think what we, what we typically see is almost the wrong people telling that story. It's told in the news. It's, it's, it's told as a objective, not a subjective thing. We hear about numbers, not about names. And I think that's so devastating so I just I, I want to make sure that all the people know that these kids are people you know and they just had misguidance no one grew up wanting to be like that they just they put us in a world that's dark that's all we see how are we going to know about life yeah that's great that's a really good way of thinking about it um we have time for a few more questions I'm going to squeeze in a few more uh this is probably a hard one for you to answer but oh. what do you see as the future of the southeast side well, if I tell you that, then there's no point in you coming to watch the film. So I cannot answer that. Um, I mean, I, I see the future of the Southeast side. And I, and I, I just, I, I see the future of, you know, any group of people or any specific place uh, as, as what you make it. So what I know is we have an uphill battle. Um, what I know is that we have our differences. And that's really hard for me to process as I'm trying to tell the story saying that we're all in unison. And we're not, you know, we have squabbles within our community just like our old community clubs had squabbles because that's just what happens when people are different and have different agendas um you know we have people that want jobs more than clean air we have people that want clean air more than jobs those things can cause a rift uh, amongst people that overall have the same wants and needs for what they think their community should have so it's it's interesting um but what i see is hope I think that's the key. That's the key to the end of this film for me is that I see hope. I see a better tomorrow. Um, it's not guaranteed, but I see the possibilities that we have with, the, with this young generation, with my sister's generation, with these activists and academics and artists and new parents and just new people. People are just coming out trying to do things about the community. So, you know, we got, sometimes we got our back to the wall, but I think we've already had generations with our back to the wall. That didn't stop us before. It's not going to stop us now. That's great. I think for our final question, you're going to really enjoy this because uh, it's what every filmmaker wants to hear, which is your Kickstarter is closed. How do we get in touch to support your project? So go ahead and uh, oh. promote your website and your social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, it, it shouldn't be closed. I might've missed the link because I'm usually the one. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm writing the film. I'm editing it. I'm producing it. I'm coming up with the ideas. I'm designing all the flyers and templates. I wrote the website. I, I'm all over the place. I might've missed the link. I try really hard to be good about the money because that's the one thing I know that we need. You know, because anything that falls out of my, anything, anything that comes out of, that's not me doing it, I have to pay. I mean, I just, I come from that place. Everybody eats where, I, where I'm from. So um, I'll take the sacrifice, but I cannot do that to other people. So money helps, you know, I'm not, it's, it's hard for me to ask money for money and it's hard for me to ask for money at this time, but some people do care and, and have, and, and can afford it. Um, so most of the links should work. If my sister's listening, double check everything, make sure we have it because you know we got to strike while, as my grandfather said, money is not like food. You cannot heat it up later when you feel like eating it. You got to eat it while it's hot. So 
Um, there should be links. I'll, I'll be sure to send you guys some stuff. Uh, we what? typically always we typically always have some kind of fundraising. Never a lot. We just ask for a couple thousand because there's just I just you know the way this has been. It's it's a hundred people putting in a dollar, not one person putting in a hundred. That's that's been what we're doing because that's just the people we're serving and we're reaching out to. But hey, uh, anybody else that got a little extra to, to donate? If you go on our website, um, southeastdocumentary.com. You can go on our Instagram, which is at a city within a city. There should be links pretty much everywhere. And if not, there will be in about 10 minutes as soon as I get off the Zoom call. <laughs> and we'll put them in the chat too, as soon as we uh, we get off. So that's okay. great. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to, to end on. Thank you so much, Stephen. This has been great. Um, I want to thank Stephen Walsh for a wonderful conversation this evening and for sharing the sneak peek of his documentary with us first time. Uh, special thanks to CPL's Latinx Heritage Committee for their special support of tonight's event. Thanks to CPL Tech Leland Mosley for producing the event tonight. And thanks to all of you for being here. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for information on other upcoming events around our theme neighborhoods, our city's bedrock, including book discussions, films, author events, art programs, and much more. Also visit the CPL YouTube and Facebook pages for on-demand video content, including from tonight's program. So if you had a friend who missed it, share the link. Have a great night, everybody.